For years now, we've been obsessed with living life on our own terms, with exploring, with waking up with a different view every day, with going off grid, far off grid. So we've spent the past year building a new mobile off-grid studio, hand-shaping a tiny home so that we can live a simple and sustainable life, so that we can roam, film, and, well, live wherever we want to. But we've done this before, and until now, off-grid living has often proved to be challenging. If we are going to be fully nomadic, and if we are truly going to be able to work and power our lives off grid and on the move, we needed to take advantage of emerging technologies to build the ultimate off grid system. Our new home is pretty small, even by tiny home standards. So you might think as minimalists, our power requirements are pretty minimal too. We're intending to live and work full time in this rig, but until this system, that just wasn't possible. Years ago, when I first started living off-grid, I used two 100 amp hour, 12 volt deep cycle batteries to power my life. The batteries were heavy, offered very limited amount of actually usable power, and in reality needed to be replaced more often than you'd expect. When lithium ion technology first hit the market, we experimented by installing a mixed cell battery and for two years, it was a game changer. The amount of usable power was significantly better, but that battery lacked some key features which eventually allowed the cells to enter thermal runaway. And the consequences for us were catastrophic. Oh my God. Everything in this combi is just being destroyed. Despite a major setback, we were still convinced that lithium held the answers to making our off-grid lives possible. But obviously, having been burnt once, pun intended, we needed to find the absolute best battery manufacturer possible. So back when we had just began our journey across the world near the Mojave Desert, when we were living in our shell of a home, we arranged to meet up with an expert chemist, a man leading the way in lithium battery technology, so that we could build a high-performance off-grid system that can meet the strict safety requirements of mobile living. My name is Dennis Ferris, and I am the Chief Executive Officer of Dragonfly Energy Battleborne Batteries. We met up with Dennis in Las Vegas to learn about off-grid battery systems. At this time, we didn't know how our finished off-grid studio would turn out. So we set up a temporary system which would get us across the country. So we're just temporarily installing these batteries um, for us to get to New York. And then when we're in the UK, we're going to be uh, installing them all properly and stacking them on top of each other and putting um, the brackets in to hold them in place. So for now we're just using um, a strap to hold it down and we'll do it properly later in the UK. Being able to power your life off grid and on the move is one of the most important aspects of mobile living. But to get the right system, there can be a significant financial outlay. Choosing wisely would give us many years of power free from energy bills. So we sat down with Dennis to discuss why we would want to go with lithium versus a traditional lead acid battery. There are a variety of differences between lead acid and lithium. The most difficult sell is that you pay more upfront for a lithium battery, but it lasts so much longer that it's way cheaper over the lifetime of the battery. Basically you buy, you make your lithium ion battery system and then you never have to replace it. Um, other differences and benefits are it's a lot lighter in terms of usable capacity, lithium is about 20% the weight of a lead acid battery system. You don't need to worry about uh, the depth of discharge. The battery management system will allow you to discharge them completely. Basically, you get the full 100 amp hours out of each 100 amp hour battery. There's no lead or acid, so it's actually non-toxic. And actually lithium iron phosphate batteries, which is the type of lithium ion batteries that allow you to make a 12 volt drop in replacement, uh, doesn't even have cobalt, which is a metal in conventional lithium ion batteries. So there's nothing toxic in a lithium iron phosphate batteries. Um, they're not corrosive and 
they're basically ex extremely reliable compared to your lead acid battery, which for example, if you discharge too low, you can ruin it. Uh, lithium ion batteries, uh, ours do, and actually all, all should have a protection management system that doesn't let you get too low. So there's really nothing you can do uh, to damage the battery. It's intended to last a very long time. It's an investment now, it's no longer a consumable, and I think that's the main difference. So these Battleborne batteries are lighter, non-toxic, and more reliable than lead acid batteries. And they deliver more than double the usable power too. But in the past we found that it's not the amount of power that they can deliver that really held us back, but actually how long they took to recharge. For your application, it's important to be able to recharge quickly. The nice thing about lithium batteries in comparison to lead acid batteries is the internal impedance is much lower. The resistance to charging is lower. And what that means practically is that your battery stays in bulk charging mode almost the entire time. So let's say you have a you know 30 amp charger. The batteries will take 30 amps up until the very end of the charge cycle. Whereas a lead acid battery will start to take that 30 amps and then hit the absorption phase, the maximum charging voltage fairly quickly. Um, lithium batteries will stay almost the entire time in bulk mode. So they charge much faster and they can take a much higher current. Practically, this means our batteries will charge much faster than they were able to do so before. We'll be discussing the three methods we have for recharging our batteries in a separate video, but let me tell you now, Battleborne batteries can handle way more power than we'll ever be able to throw at them with our system. But all this power still makes me nervous. After our previous disastrous experience, the only way that we could trust a lithium-based technology was if it had multiple safety systems. So we scoured the map in search of just such a supplier, and this is why we chose Battleborne batteries. Concerning the safety of lithium-ion batteries, which is enormously important. Lithium ion batteries obviously have a checkered past when it comes to causing fires. The basic problem with lithium ion batteries in general is that there's a liquid electrolyte. And that liquid electrolyte when combined with oxygen can be flammable. And when you get oxygen produced inside the cell because it gets very hot, that produces a condition known as thermal runaway. And that's bad. That's when you get fire started. That could be caused because you have an internal short circuit, you're charging at too high voltage, etc. So there are things that you can do to prevent this from happening. The first thing you can do is prevent oxygen from forming inside the cell. And the specific chemistry that you guys are using for your 12 volt system is lithium iron phosphate. Lithium iron phosphate was a extraordinary discovery because it was a compound that doesn't easily produce oxygen. So the oxygen comes off of the cathode at much, much higher temperatures. So thermal runaway is very, very difficult to achieve in a lithium iron phosphate system. So that's one thing, the chemistry. The other thing which is very important is to prevent the cells from getting into these conditions that could lead to thermal runaway. The features in a Battleborne battery pack uh, specifically focused for safety are number one, we, we use very high quality cells. They're all cycled, they're all tested. Um, we match every cell to form a module. We match every module in order to form a pack. In terms of temperature, lithium ion batteries tend to be a little bit finicky. They don't like cold temperature. Um, they don't like very hot temperatures. All of our packs have a battery management system that prevent you from discharging uh, too much prevents you from overcharging, prevents you from charging when it's too cold. And we also monitor the currents coming out of the pack uh, and the length of time that the currents are applied. We basically prevent the packs from being able to over deliver what the cells are able to deliver. And then externally, you have your own cabling and fusing to prevent other things from happening. But you guys are gonna be traveling in very cold climates, in very hot climates, you know, deserts and mountains. And so I think it is important that you have at least some protection where the batteries aren't operating outside of the range that they are designed to operate. Um, and that's why I think our battery management system is very suited for what you guys are trying to do. 
Right now I'm sure you can see why we've chosen lithium iron phosphate for our battery system and more importantly why we chose Battleborne batteries to provide this system. But there is more to our off-grid electrical system than batteries and we're going to go through all of the components in this and how we set them together. But I did want to say to you guys that I know that some of you at some point in the future will be upgrading to lithium iron phosphate. I mean, honestly, why wouldn't you? We asked Battleborn Batteries if they would be able to hook you guys up with a discount code and they have, so thumbs up to them. The link for the discount is in the video description below. By the time we'd driven across America and shipped across the Atlantic to the UK, we had drawn up the plans for our new tiny studio, and we knew exactly what our dream off-grid electrical system would look like. Before any of the build took place, we ran all the wires for the system. Doing this early means easier access, and also wires can be hidden out of sight behind panels if required. Each of the wire gauges, or thickness, was calculated to handle the projected current for the appliance it would serve. As often as possible, all wires ran together to reduce the chance of damaging a wire later in the build. Wires were left taped and marked whilst the rest of the studio was built, and then later we were able to connect up appliances correctly to the corresponding wires. Then we just had to figure out where the heck we were going to mount the four batteries. Battleborne batteries are actually built to be rugged, which is exactly what we need. They can take the vibrations of the road, but just to help them out a little bit, I'm using Leah's yoga mat in between the two batteries just to soften the blow. It's awesome that we can put these batteries on their side because I've only ever had lead acid batteries before, which you have to have upright all the time. Um, so these are a massive step up. We have got a bit of a challenge here trying to get multiple four, in fact, lithium ion batteries into this combi because there's not a lot of space. So we've got two on this side. We have one on that side and one the other side under our bed. So that's four in total, giving us 400 amp hours. This is our third battery out of the four and we still have our lead acid battery for starting the motor. Couple of concerns we've got about installing the batteries. Obviously they're in the engine bay, which gets pretty toasty. Um, and that's not exactly ideal for lithium ion phosphate batteries. Uh, the good thing is that these have an internal battery management system. Yes, BMS, um, which basically monitors the temperature and will shut the battery down so it cannot draw any power or be charged if it gets over temperature, which is 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And we also have the ability with this beautiful CB Performance engine to monitor the actual ambient temperature of um, not only the engine, but also the air temperature in the engine. So we'll know if we're stressing our batteries out and we'll be able to do something about it rather than just kind of running blind. But it's really nice to know that these batteries are smart enough to be able to shut themselves down if they get themselves into, or if we take them into any difficult situations, like, you know, one of the hottest places on earth, which I'm sure we're gonna discover. The other issue that we might face is that the batteries on either side are blocking the air vents. The cool air comes in the side vents here, which is great for the batteries because it's going to cool the batteries down but it might block the airflow in the engine bay. So are we gonna to have to monitor that and make sure that the airflow is, going, is flowing really well? On a combi, the battery compartments are in the engine, and this is not an ideal location. Even though we were not seeing an adverse effect on engine cooling, we know that these batteries will last longer if they are outside the engine bay. So we ended up moving two of them inside the bus. I have no idea how I'm going to fit everything in here. There seems to be space. It's just I've got an inverter to fit in. I've got a solar charge controller. I've got a kind of mains hookup device. We'll talk more about that later. That's a big old unit, but it does a good job. And we've got this battery to battery charger. Um, we'll talk about that as well. I've got to find a home for it in here somewhere. Now that you have your battery bank, you need a way to access that power. And many appliances require AC, alternating current. And the batteries, of course, are DC. Uh, so you need a device to take that DC power and make it into AC. And that device is called an inverter. 
So an inver inverter takes the DC power from the battery and it makes it an alternating current for you to plug in your, your appliances. We found out the hard way from experience that the cheaper inverters are almost always modified sine waves, which gives a dirty power and actually really does affect your electrical uh, components. Leah's laptop, for example, just would not run on our previous inverter, and we've actually broken laptop chargers from trying to run them off a modified sine wave inverter to be avoided. It is important for many appliances to have a pure sine wave inverter. So that basically uh, creates a very nice, continuous, smooth alternating current. Uh, a modified sine wave can be very choppy and some appliances don't like that at all. So this is our 1000 watts inverter responsible for giving us our AC power on board. We basically use 110 volt for the electricity for our AC appliances on board. Because we're from different countries and we travel through different countries, many of our appliances have different plug sockets and we get around that by using these international plug sockets. So this can accept any kind of um, appliance uh, and whatever the plug type is. So that helps us with our American, Australian, English, and various uh, European appliances. All of those appliances need to be able to run on 110 volts. And we generally always make sure we buy appliances that can run on both 110 and 240. To be honest, 1000 watts is definitely enough for us because we mainly only use a blender and two laptops, which are very heavy on power consumption for our editing, but we try not to use AC power on board if we can help it because it's much more efficient to use DC directly. Whenever we're using our AC inverter, we're losing about 15% in the inefficiency from the conversion process. So this is how we charge our devices just on 12 volts DC. So right now we've got this laptop charging off 12 volt, which is much more efficient. So um, wherever possible, we will try to charge directly from 12 volt. We have 12 volt sockets all around the bus to run things like our fans. These are our nighttime fans. When it gets uber hot in here, USB powered. Awesome, low voltage. Any USB accent lights that we might have, like fairy lights. We also um, charge all of our batteries for our cameras off of 12 volt DC directly using things like this that you would have seen before but importantly get the ones that are quick charge 3.0 they give much higher current make sure that your sockets are rated to at least 120 watt and all the cabling can handle that and you can actually have a lot of things charging off of a 12 volt socket we have charging bays in the front for all our navigation equipment cooling and also recharging our phone and ipad and things like that we also have one up top in our secure cabinets so that we can charge all of our batteries our fridge and our water pump both run off 12 volt dc as well as all of our fans including our max fan and all of our lights have been changed out for waterproof weatherproof leds in a warm white which we think is more cozy for a camper van environment Even our awesome water filtration, amazing system, all, even that is off 12 volts. We'll link to that up there because you're going to want to see that if you haven't seen that. So in part two of this off-grid electrical system, we're going to be looking at how we get power back into our batteries, including solar. So you'll want to be subscribed for that. All of the components that we've discussed in this video are linked below. They're all absolutely high quality in case you want to check any of those out. And also we'll link our guide to off-grid electrical systems, which helps you calculate your off-grid power needs to figure out which components you need for your system and also how to put it all together. That's all linked below along with a diagram of our system in case you're interested in checking that out. I'm sure you will be. See you in the next part, guys. Thanks for watching.